Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Cadence with Amal Borkar. I'm going to talk today about AI coprocessors. Amal, why do we need AI coprocessors? Hey, Ed, this is a very good question, and we get asked this question quite often, actually. So an AI coprocessor is essentially a, a provision that provides both flexibility and future-proofing to an AI subsystem providing the end customer, whether it's, an, it's a developer or the associate designer, the capability to run uh, the latest AI networks, both from agentic and physical AI, and the new trends of AI networks that could be coming later on down the road. So this is, to some extent, future-proofing, but it's also being able to process whatever is new very specifically, right? Absolutely. The the general challenge with AI, as you know, it's an evolving market, right? And it's an evolving landscape. The problem that we have is the hardware and software are not on the same page or not in sync because once you develop hardware, you are essentially stuck with that hardware for a long time. As you know, respinning hardware can be expensive and we can't do that all the time. The AI space, unfortunately, is not like you know the image, audio, or video codec space where there is a spec and there is a standard, and once you implement it, you can use that hardware for 10 or 15 years. Once you develop the AI hardware, as we know, today we are talking about transformers. Tomorrow we'll talk about some new variants of transformers. If your hardware is not able to support the execution or the compilation uh, and allow the end-to-end -end running of these networks, then you have a very expensive silicon that can't be used. And providing some provision of flexibility to allow those type of workloads and networks to run for many years to come becomes very important because then you can actually get the value add and the ROI on the investment made on that specific piece of silicon. Well, let's dig into this. Sure. Amal, one of the big questions here is how do you determine how much to put into the MPU and how much to put into the AI coprocessor? So that's a good question, Ed. And uh, I think there's no universal answer that says whether 5% runs on this AI coprocessor and 90% runs on the NPU or 95% or 99% runs on the NPU. This really does, depends on the customer's design of the NPU. We've seen both aspects or both ends of the spectrum. Uh, some customers might design a very lean NPU having a very, very specific list of operations and capabilities that they can run on there. And then they say, okay, Outside of these operations, everything is going to get offloaded to this coprocessor. So as an AI subsystem point of view, your general layout is always going to, is, is going to be something like this, where you have your AI coprocessor sitting next to your NPU. Maybe it's on its own, on its own AXI or interface NOC, whatever you want. But the idea is the marriage between these two allows you to create a very strong AI subsystem. Now, specifically in terms of the, the question of you know, how much percent runs on the NPU, that, as we mentioned, can, be, can go two ways, right? One is, if they've designed a very lean NPU and they say, I want only a cert certain set of operations to run on the NPU, and then the other operations run on this AI coprocessor, that could mean maybe 20, 30% gets offloaded to this uh, AI coprocessor. We have seen some customers also who have really designed their NPUs for very, very specific workloads that they know these are the type of AI networks I'm gonna run. In that case, they might be targeting about 100% or maybe in the high 90%, 98, 99% runs on the NPU. And then the advantage of this AI coprocessor is we have a lot of configurability uh, and flexibility in selecting the number of options. So if your AI coprocessor is going to be very, very minimally used, you can really despec it. You can turn down a lot of options and really have a very, very small area for this particular solution. So that way your NPU takes the spotlight has a maximum area, maximum number of max and uh, capability on there, and a very small portion is onto your AI coprocessor, uh, which does not overall impact the area footprint in the SOC. So how does this connect in so that it's pretty seamless, and how do you know exactly what you're going to be using it for, what determines that within the system? The typical architecture of the solution is uh, our DSP is the AI coprocessor, the neural edge that we have. Uh, like all our Tensilica DSPs, are sitting on uh, AXI. They just have a standard AXI interface. So usually the AI coprocessor would be sitting on the AXI. Sitting next to it would be, uh, would be the NPU. 
Most cases also sitting on an AXI. Depending on the implementation, we also have some provisions to have some tightly coupled interface, which we call a high bandwidth direct interface. This could be outside of the AXI, allowing for a streaming high-speed port or high-speed data movement between the AI coprocessor and the NPU. Now, together on the hardware level, this forms the AI subsystem. The one level above that is the software, uh, software stack or the software architecture. How does the workload get distributed between these two IPs? And this usually comes down to your compiler and your tool chain. So in the case of Tensilica and Cadence, we have our own compiler stack, which we call the Neuroweave SDK. So this can take in uh, a variety of frameworks, such as you know converting PyTorch models, Onyx, TensorFlow models. We can quantize them to various different data types, uh, int 8, int 16, or maybe in some cases, even mixed mode of operations. And in these cases, the compiler actually has the knowledge ahead of time to know what sort of operations run on the NPU, and then from there, it can get offloaded to the AI coprocessor. So this way, you can understand the split uh, and determine ahead of time what runs where between the two IPs. How do they get connected? Do you have to build an API or something into the NPU in order to make this work? That also is a couple of different ways. So our compiler, for example, has some stub interfaces that can specify that, okay, I'm running, let's take, for example, 100 layers of a network. And you can say out of those 100 layers, five of these layers will be offloaded because my NPU cannot handle them. The compiler can create some type of stub uh, or blocks over there that says, hey, I need implementations for these particular layers. And the implementation could be something that says, okay, I first fire an interrupt and tell that I'm sending this data outside. Then I send the signal outside via interrupt to say, please execute this type of a layer. Maybe it's a ReLU, it's a nonlinear operation, TANH, et cetera, that basically signals the AI coprocessor to do the execution and then send it back. So uh, at, a, at a neural network level, you're basically creating, you have a main graph which says, this is my topology of my network. And then you create a subgraph that says, these are my five things that don't run on my uh, on my NPU. I'm going to run them on a separate processor, which is this AI coprocessor. And that way, its runtime can also understand how to execute it. So why an AI coprocessor versus, say, a, a DSP or a GPU? It's a good question, Ed. And I can show an example over here. So typically, if you look at an SOC architecture, right, today's SOCs, they're quite complicated. You've got CPUs, GPUs, DSPs, and a lot of times you also have an NPU, right? And the whole idea is that I want to run my, uh, execute my AI network. And as we've discussed that if something doesn't execute us on this NPU, it gets pushed off to somewhere else, goes to an offload mechanism. These are typically the offload mechanisms, the CPUs, the GPUs, or the DSPs. They all have their uh, trade-offs, primarily because CPU is a general purpose machine, can't really do a lot of vector processing. Uh, GPUs are great, but they're not very, power efficient, they're very power hungry, you'll get good performance, but really eat up on the power. DSPs, we also have those, this is a good balance, but you know, there's not something that's been there that does a very efficient, specific, you know, purpose specific build to assist the coprocessor. Second reason also is that we are seeing that these SOC architectures are getting more and more complicated. Like if you go in the ADA space, the phone space, data centers, all of these guys, they have sort of like clusters or complexes because there's not one CPU. There's usually a CPU complex where they'll have, in the case of ARM, big little architecture. So they'll have multiple large high performance CPUs with small, low performance with CPUs. GPUs also can have some complexes where they have like high performance 3D graphics engines with some lightweight 2D rastering engines. DSPs usually sit in a sensor hub where you'll have maybe an audio DSP, a vision DSP, a sensing DSPs. And then the NPUs are sitting in their own complex. So not just are they sitting in separate complexes, the problem is also interfacing between the complexes can become challenging because on paper it looks fine. Yes, there's an NPU sitting over here. It can talk to this other IP in, uh, through AXI. But what we've heard from customers also is uh, from some of our customers, when they've designed these architectures, when they need to do the offload, it's quite challenging and painful to actually send the data from the NPU into a separate complex. So the idea with this newer architecture, if we call this SOC 2.0, you actually have an AI subsystem over here where you have an NPU, maybe you have a multi-core NPU, and you can put the AI CP next to it, this AI coprocessor, NeuroEdge. It sits on its own dedicated NOC or its own internal um, uh, fabric. So that way, 
Anything that doesn't run on the NPU gets offloaded to this AI core processor, but it's within its own subsystem. So you don't have to go outside. You get a lot of power performance and uh, efficiency, and everything is localized, and you can maybe power shut off some of these items too and get a very good energy or power footprint. And unlike a giant NPU, which may take years to pull together and you may have derivative chips out of that, you're going to have a lot of the same functionality. Your yield is going to be much harder to achieve on this large NPU. With a, a small coprocessor, you can basically turn this out pretty fast at whatever node you have to do it at, right? Absolutely. And that's that's actually one of the selling points of Tensilica as well, because we do, uh, we do soft IP. So we're not restricted to... Uh, 16 nanometer, 7 nanometer, or anything like that. We we do our internal characterization so that we know where it stands in terms of PPA and uh, uh, power energy analysis. But it's soft IP, so uh, and it's available right now. We've done our own internal you know place and route, so we know what the footprint looks like. But we have customers who want to use it on 22, on 16, on 28, on 3, on 2 nanometer. So there's no restriction for that. We're not we are soft IP, and we're not restricted to any specific technology node or frequency for that matter. And one of the issues that you're dealing with here is that in order to take advantage of a lot of these markets, this, this software is moving a lot faster than the hardware in terms of development. So it may take you years to design the hardware for a an NPU, and it's going to be a derivative chip upon derivative chip, and you basically work through all these problems, you work through the processes, whereas this is just basically, hey, here's a new new feature we have to be able to address. We can't do it very efficiently otherwise. Yes, that's a good that's a good point. That actually brings out to uh, in the automotive sector, you have a long lifespan of your silicon, and you can't keep revving up your silicon all the time. So, at the NPU, while being efficient, it's still a piece of fixed function hardware, it's RTL. So once you bake it, you're done and you're set with that for ten years. How do you adapt with the changing AI landscape and the networks that are constantly evolving? And if they don't run on the NPU then this AI coprocessor comes to the rescue because it is a small, efficient piece of programmable hardware, which uh, if we have the implementation in our compiler stack for the net, for that particular layer or operation that doesn't run on the NPU, that's great. If not, you can write your own custom implementation. And then aside from that, you also have the capability to add your custom instructions using our tie, which is called Tensilica Instruction Extensions, gives you additional flexibility for future-proofing and running some of these newer workloads. How new is this idea? I mean, this has been around to some extent for years, right? Yeah, actually, it's a good question you ask about that because the general idea of AI coprocessors actually has been around for a long time. And it's not just us. Surprising enough, actually, in the public domain also, there are several of the big uh, AI vendors that are actually using AI coprocessors. So this is all in public public domain. So NVIDIA, for example, in their Jetson, they have their DLA, which is their deep learning accelerator, sitting next to their GPU. And sitting next to that is a PVA, which is a programmable vision accelerator. It essentially handles a lot of the operations that the DLA can run. So like they, they published white papers that show that accelerating nonlinear uh, maximal suppression, NMS type of operations on this PVA has provided significant performance improvement. Intel Gaudi 3, for example, also has a Mac array, which I believe they call a MMA, Math Multiply Accelerator. Sitting next to that is what they call a TPC, Tensor Processing Core. If you look at the spec of Tensor Processing Core, it is a, I believe it's a 2024-bit DSP, a VLAW-based DSP that handles the operations that the their NPU or their Mac accelerator can't run. The only difference over here is all the outside vendors primarily have been doing this as a vertical integration in the sense that the AI coprocessor is there, but it's part of their whole AI solution. We license IP, so we have NPUs, we have DSPs, and then we have the AI coprocessors that can be paired with the NPU. And for the customer, it's a seamless marriage of a very strong AI subsystem allowing you to run a whole slew of networks of today, as well as giving you the flexibility and future proofing to run networks of tomorrow. Also adds an element of democratization into the industry too, right? Because in the past it was all, you got this giant AI chip and this is going to run everything. But now you can say, well, no, it's not going to run everything. There's a lot of other pieces that go around this. Absolutely. And that's definitely on the technical side that like, yeah, now you have multiple pieces that can be put into this puzzle to allow the solution to work. At the same time, one what we are seeing also is that since this AI landscape is constantly changing, some of the customers are finding it challenging to put all these pieces together, and they're saying, 
can you up level this little bit keep it on an ai subsystem level that today i need to run DeepSeek. tomorrow i need to run llama 700b i can't keep changing my hardware all the time can this can you abstract it at an ai subsystem that i drop the network into your ai system you figure out how it's going to run between the ips and then you give me the results so there's a combination of both the hardware flexibility and then your compiler tool chain that can consume the network and figure out the distribution between the IPs for the workload as well. You have multiple points of control by doing it that way, right? Absolutely, yeah. We do give provide the flexibility to the customer, or in some cases, we have pre-configured options in our compiler also, which target you know, that you that allow you to choose either performance or accuracy, and you can turn those knobs depending on what your uh, end target, uh, what what your metrics are going to be for your solution. Amal Borkar, thanks for a great explanation. Ed, always a pleasure. Thank you for your time.